I am Hayden Penetier, and we are here at the studio recording Until Dawn. My name is Rami Malik, and I play Josh. My name is Megan Martin. My name is Brett Dalton. My name is Antonella Lentini, and I played Hannah and Beth. My name is Jordan Fisher, and I play the character Matthew, Matt for short. I'm Nicole Bloom, and I play Emily in the game. My name is Noah Fleiss. I am Galadriel Steinman, and I play Ashley. So Until Dawn is a story of eight teenagers who uh, revisit this cabin in the woods about a year later after a, a really traumatic experience where I've lost two of my sisters. So coming to kind of get some closure in that respect. One of the things that Larry does really well is make these multi-layered characters. And I think for just the story in general, it's, it follows the quintessential horror film plot lines. but the characters are so unique in themselves, and I think that's very cool. Oh, I hope this was the right thing to do. What? You know, getting everyone together on the anniversary. I mean, Josh seemed really pumped about us all doing something, didn't he? Yeah, no, he definitely did. I haven't seen him so excited about something in forever. Good, good. Sam, Sam and I have uh, a few things in common, such as being huge lovers of animals and she's a huge animal lover she's vegan she um, she is a pacifist I'm not quite sure if I'm gonna go as far as saying that I'm a pacifist but uh, she's spunky and cool I know that she I think is is made fun of a little bit by the rest of them who who think that her morals and her beliefs in that area are a little ridiculous and they don't agree with them but she doesn't care it doesn't stop her from being herself and that's something that i hope i have in common with her you know he definitely uh can be depressed at some times and a bit of a loner but he, he takes some solace in one of his sister's friends sam played by hayden penetere and uh invites everybody back to the same house the next year to kind of find some closure. Jessica is, she has a whole lot of personality. She is definitely the sort of mean girl character that, you know, at school she, she knows she's pretty, she knows that boys like her and she's gonna use it to her advantage. He's got a big heart and you can tell that that's very evident, especially how he treats his girlfriend, Emily. And, um, you know, he's, he's kind of a meathead, but in the best way possible. She really knows what she wants and she manages to to get that from whomever it is, whether it be Matt or Mike, you know, she's really driven and I can definitely relate to that. My, my character is uh, Chris and he is uh, what society might consider the nerd of the group um, and, and he kind of embraces it. Um, Ashley is, she's a little more serious than some of the other girls. Um, she's definitely very intelligent and, and thoughtful. She kind of looks at the whole big picture of things. She's not quite as geeky as Chris, but they connect in a lot of ways. Mike is like big guy on campus. He's uh, the class president who has some charm and has, has a brain. And I, I don't know, people seem to like Mike. He gets away with a lot, though. He's, he can be kind of kind of jerky. The fact that he, he really just kind of wants everyone to be happy when he wants for he's, he's a people pleaser and um, it's, I, can, I can definitely attest to being you know that guy. I'm, I'm always the friend that wants everybody to be happy and wants everybody to be taken care of and that's definitely Matt. But also like this character is just so fun. I rarely get to play the bitch. And so it was really, it was really fun to do that. The spirit of things, seriously, what's wrong with you? I'm just trying to lighten the mood, Em. Don't be like that. Like what? The way you're being, you always get like this. I just think this is just the coolest thing to be a part of. And um, I just think it's gonna take the world by storm. I really do. I think this genre is the wave of the future. And I think that 
um, once people see the potential behind it uh, of getting to interact with the drama that you're witnessing unfold um, in such a realistic way, um, that this, this is how entertainment's going to be from now on. Hi, this is Lee Robinson, production designer on Until Dawn. The production design for Until Dawn started with the great teen horror script that sets the characters in a Canadian Winter Mountain Lodge, being a contemporary setting with visual clues derived from classic films of that genre, such as Hitchcock's Psycho and Stanley Kubrick's Shining. The storyboards are vital to the production design as it allows the designer to understand the scale of the environments to be made and the detail that would be seen to create the atmosphere of a horror. This took us into concepts that took these storyboards further, visualizing the world through the color palette, the lighting, tone and the mood, and developing key locations such as the lodge, the cable car stations, the forests themselves, the wilderness. As you can see, the environments and atmospheres changed quite a bit from warm and inviting to cold and threatening. The Millionaire's Mountain Lodge was a key example. It was designed to be made from nearby stone and timber, embedding it into the landscape, with a contrasting and contemporary interior needing to be opulent and extravagant. We created dark and claustrophobic corridors with ominous and large open spaces, almost cathedral-like in size, and with huge structures to silhouette and dwarf the characters within providing a labyrinth to explore and wander. Each character was developed with a strong visual identity in mind, with contrasting colours, tones and silhouettes to identify them, each to have their own texture, pattern and shape, so that when they were lined up you could always identify them. The costume designs allowed a range of clothes that would suit them for the cold winter weather but also have an element of style and individualism so that the audience could look at them and relate, recognizing themselves within them. A lady would like to cuddle up with her man by a nice cozy fire bathed in atmospheric mood lighting. Right. It'll get plenty toasty once we're rubbing up against each other. My yeah. fire and mood lighting. Yes. Working with the lighting artists, we really brought the look and feel of the world together, and this required a thorough understanding of the visual language of teen horror. A key scene was where all the characters emerge out of the rear of the lodge chasing Hannah. A contrast is evident straight away from the exterior wilderness to the warmth of the lodge. The attention to character lighting here is through the bounce and rim lighting, accented colours and composition, creating characters that come from the dark into the light and back again with an emotional effect. Guys! There's someone outside. What the hell? Hannah! What's going on? Where's my sister going? Oh, it's fine. She just can't take a joke. It was just a prank, Han. Until Dawn is a game that's full of horror and one of the things we decided to do early on was to take a scientific approach to how scary it was. So we did experiments on people and we measured their responses to the game. We created a test area, it's as close to a home setup as we can get it. We've recruited ordinary people to play the game and we've left them to play it on their own. You're turning the light off. <laughs> The only difference is it's rigged with cameras and microphones that relay the data through to the next room where people are watching them play. <laughs> Bracelet here, we use for biometric testing. It measures the player's emotional response. It's called a galvanic response sensor. It makes contact with the user's skin and it measures the electrical conductivity across their skin. It's the same principle as an old-fashioned lie detector. When you're, when you're stressed, you sweat a little, very sensitive, it picks up tiny changes if the player is feeling anxious or scared. That data is fed back to a testing team, comes through as a graph. I'm so sorry. There's no point testing one or two people, you have to test a lot of people. Okay, watch your step. 
when we have a scare that consistently has a measurable emotional response, then we knew it was good. If it didn't have that, it goes back to the team for improvement. The data doesn't tell us what's wrong with the scare, it only tells us if it's working or not. Wait, okay, so you hear that too, right? Josh. Here what? we have a chapter relatively early in the game. Weirdly regular. Not, not nothing regular about it. We have to create tension and anxiety in the player so they are ready to, to receive the scare. the player time to recover, to cool down, to calm down, and then start building the tension again bef before we do the next scare. Hey. Uh, what? Hey. What the hell? Oh, you just got mucked. Yeah, it's such an adrenaline high when I get... There's two things we found. One, one is we could look at the scares, analyse if our expected scares were working effectively. Were people shrieking and covering their hands or were they getting an emotional response from it? And being scientific about it means that we strip out people's opinions about whether things are working or not. We've got data and we look at the data. If it's working, we're happy with it. Really scary. <laughs> But scared and wanting to get away. <laughs> um, I actually made a bit scared to play on my own, but <laughs> in a room with the lights on, yeah, with some other people as well, yeah, maybe. But because I'm a scaredy cat, I would play with someone in the room. <laughs> and the lights on. It was one of the scariest games I've played in a long while. Hi, Larry. Hey, Graham. Hi, my name is Graham Resnick. I'm a filmmaker, writer, director, sound designer, and uh, I started working with Larry Fessenden about 10, 15 years ago through my friend Ty West, who I grew up with and uh, have done a lot of sound design with on his films. And uh, he was producing Ty's films at the time, and uh, Ty introduced me to Larry. Larry produced my first feature, and we've written together on several projects. My name is Larry Fessenden. I'm a filmmaker. I, uh, I run Glass Eye Picks, which is um, an independent production company out of New York. We make indie movies, uh, a lot of scary movies as well. Um, and uh, I got a call to audition to write uh, this video game. And uh, I called my pal Graham Resnick because Graham is a gamer. And um, while I thought I could offer something to the idea of writing this multi-branching story, I knew that I would want Graham's expertise as a lover of uh, gameplay since I guess games were started. So and, and, and just as a lover. That's and as a lover, yes. Which <laughs> is why there's so many sex jokes in the yeah. in the game. There was one Italian website that did say the oh, that's right. and Graham Resnick, the two lovers behind <laughs> Until Dawn. Come here. Maybe I know how to handle you too. I am definitely ready to be handled. So I wanted Graham by my side, uh, yeah, and we we got the gig, and it was it's been an amazing ride. Oh hell yeah! Oh my God, she's taking her shirt off. What? Oh my God, Matt, what are you doing here? Uh, Hannah. I'm sorry, Hannah. Hannah. It's all gonna happen. Just a so in the game, the, the basic setup is that uh, a year prior to the game's start, all these kids had gone up to a, a ski lodge that was owned by the parents of one of the kids, uh, or a couple of the kids, and um, some of the teenagers played a prank on some of the other teenagers, and a terrible tragedy occurred when a few of them, uh, two sisters, ran out into a blizzard, and uh, were never seen from again. <laughs> So now, a year later, uh, this has kind of torn apart this group of friends. They've, uh, they've gone through some trials and tribulations in the past year. The brother of the two girls has uh, had a lot of psychological issues. And, and to kind of help him cope, 
uh, and help them all get over it, they all returned to the lodge a year later, back up on the mountain. And uh, the idea is to, <laughs> to get over it, but... Um, the healing does not begin. Does not begin. <laughs> yeah. And these kids are all trying to find themselves. They've, they've, they've been through a trauma, but in general, they're just teenagers trying to figure out who they are. So they're all kind of falling into the patterns, the, the stereotypes, the, the characters they see on TV and in the movies. I think we were very interested in taking genre tropes and kind of making them uh, sort of refresh them. Hey, did you see that? Dad said it'd just be us this weekend. We're familiar with how slasher movies work. Uh, you know, most people have seen some horror movies, and we have established notions and preconceptions about the roles of the players in horror movies and how they talk and how they get killed and how they have sex. And to bring you into the game that way and then subvert a lot of those expectations is kind of our, our goal. They're haunted by some incident that happened in their past, which I think you pretty much figure out that that's going to have a role in their, uh, in their interaction. <laughs> yeah, so I think what was fun was we take some sort of stock characters and we try to give them some shape, but um, at least at the beginning they're recognizable in the, um, in the way of groups of friends. There's, you know, the jock and the, yeah. um, and the bitchy girl and the rivalries between everyone. And oh my gosh. Um, and really fun characters too. Like these, it's, we just had so much fun living in the minds of these characters through writing the, writing the script. What do you think? Ah! Jesus! <laughs> you know, it was fun. We, I think we were looking to get that kind of banter that you yeah. see both in movies, but also that you absolutely have with friends and sort of those inside jokes. And of course, as writers and as friends ourselves, we sort of developed little tracks and we try right. to give the characters that kind of vibe. Jason Graves, and I'm the composer for Until Dawn. I've been involved with Until Dawn for about a year now. Originally, I was contacted by Barney Pratt, the audio director. I think that had something to do with my lineage of horror games, and hopefully not the fact that my last name is Graves, although a lot of people seem to associate my name with scary music. One of the things that was really exciting about working with Barney and the team at Supermassive is they really wanted something unique for the music. They wanted the music to stand out and be a character on its own in the game. When I'm first starting on a new score, and it doesn't matter if it's film, television, or games, I always end up going to the main theme. Sometimes the developer or producer isn't even necessarily interested in the main theme at the beginning. I just want to do it for myself because for me the main theme is the identity of the game. It establishes the mood, the atmosphere, and the character of the music and how it's going to be playing in the background. And that's what we did with Until Dawn. That was actually my demo pitch to Supermassive Games. I put a main theme together, recorded all the instruments at my studio, and sent it to them and they liked it we actually ended up recording that exact theme all the instruments and everything live here at ocean way probably nine months ago and that's what we've been using in all the demos for the game and that's the final version of the theme that is the main theme that you'll hear on the menus and in some key pieces of gameplay I 
seem to have made a name for myself in horror. And there's something about scary music, I think it's maybe the lack of rules. The biggest rule in scary music is there are no rules, so you can do anything you want, and actually, if you end up doing things that don't feel like they would work out together, they kind of clash and it ends up being even more effective for scary music. So that's what really drew me to Until Dawn was the textures, plus writing thematic material that is interwoven with the scary textures. I haven't really done anything like that before. Usually it was just all, all tension all the time, and that's fun and it's great. I'm actually at heart a very melodic composer. That's the kind of music I love listening to, and that's the kind of music I love writing. That's the kind of music I got to work on in Until Dawn. Very nice. Same thing. My name is Will Biles, Executive Creative Director of Until Dawn. The first part of getting a believable facial performance in game is to capture topographically the actor's range of emotional expressions as separate versions of the same head. Every tiny nuance gets digitized and merged, effectively creating a model that can recreate every facial movement that the actor makes. Once the topography has been recorded, the actor's performance itself can be captured by using a predetermined set of marker points drawn precisely on the face and a high-def helmet cam wirelessly linked to capture devices. The camera is the small box where it looks like the microphone should be. It records in high-def the movement of the dots throughout the performance that will drive the expressions captured earlier. Unlike other systems, this form of capture is far less lossy because there are fewer interpretations between performance captured and performance rendered finally in game. The audio is also recorded via two separate Lavalier mics attached to the helmet. It takes a while for the actors to acclimatize to carrying around the recording devices and the helmet cams, but very soon the shoot becomes similar to any other effects shoot or a green screen shoot. The actors in these scenes are only recording facial animation, but use cursory body movements for pacing. Wait, and maybe we should all stick together and find everybody and make sure they're all okay, so... One, one, the year before the prank. Take two, Mark. Other than the other actors, they have to use their imagination for everything and everywhere that they are supposed to be seeing and feeling. From a hot midday studio in Los Angeles to a freezing midnight mountain in British Columbia. Until Dawn has a dynamic, ever-changing story, the facial performances and the body performances are recorded separately with different systems. With the body capture, we use reflective bead suits and an infrared camera matrix system that drives the CG bone hierarchies in our character models. <sighs> These performances cover everything from character locomotion, scene-specific performances and stunt work, most of which was recorded at studios in Pinewood and Shepparton, near London. Anna! Hello? Combining all the elements Anna. seamlessly in the final game becomes a formidable editing and logistical task. Every variation, both physical and emotional, must be combined in these multi-edits. <laughs> Scaffolding props have to stand in for the sets because the hundreds of infrared cameras have to be able to see all of the reflective beads on the actor. America's Northwoods border region. Within this land of 10,000 lakes and miles of dense timber, a hideous creature 
is believed to lurk. The North Woods is probably one of the last frontiers in America. There's still a lot of places in, in this area that hasn't been set foot by man. Monsters and mysteries exist here because it is remote. Up in the North Woods, winters are long. In times of biting cold and isolation, a devouring monster is believed to come forth. It's terrorized native people for generations. Growing up, I was told, like, don't go outside, the Wendigo will get you. Among the traditions of the northern Algonquin tribes is the Wendigo, a monster that can seize hold of a person to carry out its hunger for human flesh. Many Native Americans fear even talking about this Wendigo. And even the mention of the name will let the Wendigo find out where you are, and it will open you up to be possessed by this Wendigo. The most famous case of a Wendigo possession took place in 1879. In the deep woods outside of Edmonton, Alberta, Swift Runner, a Cree Indian, was a trapper and a guide. He had left town the previous autumn with his wife, six children, and his mother. But when Swift Runner returned in spring, he was alone. Swift Runner came into a nearby village telling this heartbreaking tale. I had to watch them starve to death. Of his family being killed by starvation, and that he was the only survivor. My whole family, gone. It wasn't hard to understand a family falling victim to a brutal winter. To even not. Yet something was suspicious about Swift Runner. He was a, a strapping man, and he came into town weighing over 200 pounds. It didn't look like somebody who had just weathered a terrible winter. He wasn't malnourished, didn't look like he was starving. He looked healthier than ever. After a few nights, it became clear that something was wrong. He started having night terrors, screaming in his sleep. I am the Wendigo. Villagers alerted the police. Swift Runner actually guided them back to his winter cabin. When they got there, that's when they saw the true horror. Human skulls were scattered around, many bones, some of which had been snapped in half and the marrow inside had been drained. They had never seen anything like it. Swift Runner had killed his entire family, shooting them, hitting them with an ax, strangling, and then eating most of their bodies. Right up until the moment the noose was on his neck, Swift Runner swore the evil spirit of the Wendigo had possessed him and twisted him into a cannibal killer. When he was on the gallows, Swift Runner himself said, I am no longer a man. Just move over there. Go on, move. Let me say what I came to say. I'm here to tell you what you're up against being back on this mountain. You should never have returned. I don't know why you did after what happened last year. You mean with Hannah and Beth? Yeah, how could you know without being involved? I don't take kindly to you kids coming up here to my mountain. Your mountain? The mountain don't belong to me, it's true. But it don't belong to the Washingtons. This mountain belongs to the Wendigo. Hi, this is Lee Robinson, production designer at Supermassive Games. Understanding the ancient myths of the Wendigo was key for their development that helped the visual look. Through sketches and concepts, these elements were visualized, such as eyes being milky, almost dead, with loss of lips and eyelids due to frostbite, fangs growing and arms and legs getting longer, with skin hardening and thickening to look snarling and menacing, yet withered and lean. What the hell was that? Another. 
fingers and toenails extending like claws, allowing them to climb effortlessly. We made them look gaunt and weathered, and having ragged remains of clothes they wore, blood-stained and rotten, with patches of hair still remaining. They retained strong skeletal limbs, which enabled them to be agile and quick through the environment. Where are you? My name is Jamie Gallopo, animation director at Supermassive. The overall direction on the creature was to be very strong, to be extremely fast. We wanted a spider-like movement to the creature. One minute scampering, to leaping, and then crawling. Almost instantaneous. And finally, we wanted the creature to have this real, uncontrollable thirst for flesh. From a sound design perspective, the Wendigo is a real challenge. For the main vocalizations of the Wendigo, we used our own vocalizations, various different animals from the exotic to the farmyard, various uh, plugins and processes to gel these sounds together and keep a human resonance behind that voice, telling the backstory of the Wendigo. During the chase sequences, the anger of the Wendigo is felt by encircling breaths, screams and screeches um, that uh, essentially chase you as you're being chased by the Wendigo. We would uh, layer them up in a multitude of layers, sometimes 15, 20 sounds playing at the same time, to build up the vocalizations for this fearsome creature which is always in attack mode, hyperactive and chasing you throughout the game. 